chapter 2 to begin with today. Jonah chapter 2. unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. Thou hast cast me into the deep in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters can pass me about even to the soul. The depth closed me round about, the weeds are wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with her bars was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee, into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy. I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. The Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon dry land. Bow our heads and ask the Lord to guide us in our lesson today. Heavenly Father, we pray that once again we would learn the principles that we need to have for our own lives here and now from very long ago. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. All right, we have been looking at chapter 2, uh, and uh, chapter 2, the book of Jonah, we see Jonah at his best, which is pretty pitiful. Amen. He doesn't look good in chapter 1, chapter 3, chapter 4. Uh, but chapter 2 doesn't look all that great either. Mm. But he, he was, he, he did make some progress when he got to chapter 2. And um, we wish we could put a lot of accolades on his head, but uh, it's just not possible to do that. Uh, he, he could be doing a whole lot better than what he is in chapter 2. So, uh, we're looking in Lesson 7 for this, and uh, uh, in Lesson 7, we were looking last week at affliction-driven principles, and pointing out to you how sad it is, so oftentimes in our lives, the only time that we do something that is right in the eyes of the Lord is when we are in affliction. And isn't that a sad thing? Amen. And I'm not talking about unsaved people, people that don't know the Lord and don't want to know the Lord. I'm talking about people that know the Lord. Jonah was the Lord's prophet. That was not a small accolade. Uh, to be a prophet of the Lord, a true prophet of the Lord, there are all kinds of false prophets Amen. back then, but he was a true prophet of the Lord, but he was also reluctant, disobedient, complaining, uh, full of himself, and then it wasn't until the fish got full of him <laughs> that uh, he started to come around and show some sense uh, toward the Lord. So we see, and, and this is a sad state of affairs, we see Jonah at his best when he was at his worst. And we tried to point out to you last week that uh, uh, in, in our lives when things are going very bad for us, this is often the time when we can get closest to God and learn the most about Him. As we go through this life and everything's hunky-dory, we don't pay much attention to the Lord. Amen. Not as much as we should. When we're satisfied, 
then our satisfaction replaces him in our consciousness. So sometimes it's, it's a good thing for us not to be as satisfied as we want to be. And this is a principle that's found throughout Christian history. Uh, the Lord uses trials, temptations, difficulties, sorrows, even in the Lord's ministry in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, most of what we see in the Lord's work was for people that were in dire need. He went from one sick person to another sick person to a demoniac person to uh, uh, religious leaders that were against him and had gotten their doctrines all wrong. Uh, you, read, you read the history of the Lord Jesus Christ, the happy days are rare. Amen. For, I'm talking about the Lord now. The days when he was, was really, really happy, when he was content, uh, when, uh, when he was filled with joy, are rare indeed. And that's a sad state of affairs. But whose fault was it? It wasn't the Lord's fault. Amen. It's because the people, his own people of Israel, had strayed so far away from him. Hmm. So it was, he was sad because of the way they were living. Jonah was sad because of the way he was living, and the Lord wasn't too pleased either. So here's lessons for us to glean. Uh, in our lives today. Uh, if, we're, if we've got problems and difficulties, what, how, what's our relationship with God like? Amen. Is there something there that needs to change? Uh, the, this is God taking us uh, to the woodshed, so to speak. Yes. And we, if we're not paying any attention to Him, and we, we do this constantly, when things are going well, uh, we can go without him, it seems like. And I'm talking about people who are true Christian, people who are truly saved. And this should not be. So these are, all, these are lessons from the life of Jonah. When we see Jonah at his best, it still doesn't look very good, does it? And in our lives, let's not overrate ourselves. Let us constantly be looking at our relationship with the Lord every day of our lives and always questioning ourselves, never him. Yes, never amen. Him. Amen. Always questioning ourselves. What is my relationship with God today? Is it what it ought to be? Could it be better than it is? Is it something that's pleasing to him? Now, when we read this book of Jonah, was there any pleasure for God in this? No. Not from Jonah. Well, let me back up and ask you again. <laughs> In the book of Jonah, was there any pleasure for God? Absolutely. Ah, uh, ah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now it's ringing home, isn't it? Uh, the estimated population of the capital city of Nineveh at this time was about a one million people. I can't be absolutely sure about that, but. Uh, Historically, it seems about accurate. And they were all, they all repented and put their faith in God. Hallelujah. So, Jesus said, there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repented. Hmm. More than over 99 just persons that need no repentance. Amen. Can you imagine then the joy that God must have been feeling wow. at this time? But it wasn't Praise shared God. by his prophet. Uh, and that's a sad thing indeed. So, another great lesson we need to learn here is what are you and I doing in our lives to try and please God? Hmm. And I didn't ask, what are we doing to please ourselves? Amen. Because, wow. <laughs> every day in the whole world, saved and unsaved, are doing everything they can to please themselves. 
And that's not where the real joy is. Amen. The real joy comes when we are seeking to please God in our lives. All right, so this is lesson seven in your quarterly there. And the objectives, remember, to build a consistent relationship with God in our lives rather than simply trusting them in the time of difficulties. So Jonah looks best in chapter 2 when he was in difficulties. It would have been wonderful if he could have looked good in the whole history Amen. that's presented here. Um, second objective is to help us understand that crisis Christianity usually doesn't last past the crisis. And oftentimes, for a, a person who's truly saved, they get into a difficult situation, suddenly they get a wake-up call, hey, I better get on my knees, I better get back with God, uh, because I have needs now. And, uh, and we do that, and God is always there. Uh, he loves us a lot more than we love him. Amen. And uh, so he, he's always there for us, but is this the shining point of our lives as believers, as Christians? It shouldn't be. That we are only close to him when we've been walking far away from him mm -hmm. and gotten ourselves in a lot of trouble. So crisis Christianity, what is that? Jonah suddenly looks good in chapter 2. Why? Because he got into a real crisis. Amen. I guess being inside the belly of a fish is about as bad as you can get. Uh, did uh, God have his attention then? Oh, yes. He had Jonah's full and undivided attention. I mean, what is there to see in the belly of a fish? <clears throat> Absolutely nothing. It's pitch black. It'd be pitch black, it was cold, there were cold-blooded animals, there was seaweed wrapped about his head. And he the digestive, here. And the no, digestive no Facebook. acids. Yeah. Yeah. No Facebook. <laughs> no Facebook, no computers. Um, uh, shoot. That's where food got digested, by the fish. It must have smelled horrible, and it went in wet, there was no place to dry out. Uh, this is, this is a very miserable place indeed for him, but this was what was necessary to bring him into the right relationship with God, at least for a moment of time. Yes. Um, so he, he, would, he, he, he prayed, prayed a prayer of repentance here and uh, uh, said he's going to sacrifice to God with the voice of thanksgiving. Uh, these are all good things here. Uh, he says, Jehovah Jehoshua, uh, salvation is of the Lord. Amen. And what he was admitting there, he didn't want the Ninevites to get saved. They were Israel's enemies. Mm -hmm. They did horrible, horrible, horrible things to his own kind, his kinsmen, other Israelites. He didn't want them to get saved, but God wanted them to be saved. Amen. And uh, so when he says salvation of the Lord, we see him at his best. Mm -hmm. Salvation is of the Lord. Do you understand that? Amen. I don't want to pass out tracts. That's not the issue. Salvation is of the Lord. It's not Amen. about us. Amen. Amen. Getting people saved, that's not our opinion. Amen. That's not our decision. That's not our uh, our Standing in life, whether to fulfill the Great Commission or not, I don't feel like it today, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, we see John at his best when he recognizes that God is providential, God is sovereign, God is in control, especially in the matter of people repenting and coming to know him as Savior. Amen. <clears throat> and Jonah gets that place. He wanted salvation to be of Jonah. So this up to this point. Amen. He wanted salvation to be of Jonah. God said, "Go to Tarshish or go to Nineveh and preach to them." And uh, he said, "No." 
I don't want them to be saved. And I'm not going there. And he did everything in his power not to go there. But God brought him to this place after three days and three nights. That still amazes me. And Jonah was a believer. He was a true believer. But backslid. Terribly backslid. And, and for true believers to get this far from God that they want to be sovereign over who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. That's pretty bad. You're stripping God of the greatest of he, every He has every right. Amen. Every right there is is God's. But uh, the right of heaven and hell is His greatest right. He's not willing that any should perish. Amen. But it also comes repentance. So, uh, Jonah was willing for people to perish. That's horrible. Amen. For a true believer. That's horrible. Uh, what an awful thing. But you know, when we refuse to try and share the gospel with other people around us, without us realizing it, maybe, that's where we are. We're willing for other people to perish. And God isn't. Amen. So if we're going to be one with the Lord, if we're going to walk with the Lord, then uh, we're going to have to come to this principle. Salvation is of the Lord. Amen. That's Amen. his work. <clears throat> That's his decision. That's his burden. Amen. And that's his task for us to fulfill. So, uh, uh, crisis Christianity doesn't last very long. And uh, uh, it's also another lesson we get from chapter 2. If you make a vow to God, please keep it. Please keep it. How often don't we do that? get in a really, really, really bad situation and we can't see any way out and so we finally get on our knees and say, Lord, help me. And he always does. He always does. But uh, when we make a promise to God, we should keep it. Has he ever promised you something and not done it? <laughs> Never. Always does it. Always. He always keeps his word. He's always faithful. Yeah, he always keeps his word. Amen. Always. Uh, he, he promised uh, way back in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve first fell that his son was going to come into this world and provide a remedy for what they, Adam and Eve, had just done. And God did it. Amen. God did it. He sent his son into the world. Thank he you. sent Jonah to Nineveh. But, uh, and Jonah finally went there against all of his desires. He finally went there. What a horrible attitude that we see when he gets there in the next chapters. But anyway, uh, crisis uh, Christianity doesn't last very long. And if we're going to make a vow to God, let's make sure that it's, we keep it. We keep it. We add to that today as well. If you keep it, don't keep it grudgingly. Mm -hmm. he, he, he says uh, in verse 9, I, I will pay that I have vowed. There was a time in his life when God called him to be a prophet, and he vowed to be a prophet for the Lord. So he got that job and that calling, <clears throat> but now he didn't want to do it because it was Ninevites. He didn't want to do it. But uh, God brought him around. And he says, I will pay that I have vowed. So when you accept the Lord as your Savior, you're making a vow to live for him forever. I hope you realize that. When you accept the Lord as your Savior, repenting of your sins, you're making a vow to him. So uh, uh, when we make the vow to God, then we need to keep those Bibles. All right, so Jonah, he prayed to the Lord. Now, Roman numeral one, uh, we have uh, 
Affliction-driven principles. Roman numeral one. Affliction-driven principles. I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord. That's not the best. But it was all that was left to God. To get uh, Jonah to develop some principles of Christian living by putting him inside this fish. So he cried unto the Lord, finding why? Because he was afflicted. When you pray, what's your motive? I hope it's not just because something bad's in your life and you need help. Now, if that's true, it's all right. If you have problems, God's there for you. Amen. And there's nothing wrong with praying to him when you are in trouble and in difficulties. But there's an awful lot, lot wrong with not praying to him Amen. when you're not in trouble. So we should measure our prayer time not by our difficulties, but by our non-difficulties. Does that make sense? Yes. How much time do we spend in prayer with God when we don't need to? When we always need to. We need to. When we don't, when we think everything's fine and we don't need to pray, that's a really good time to honor God by going to Him in prayer. Amen. Spending some time with Him. <clears throat> And uh, God is watching over us all the time. Amen. Not just when we need him. God is watching over us. So uh, does, it, is it, is it, does it take a crisis to put us on our knees with God? Uh, hopefully not. Um, Daniel was certainly the Bible example par excellence of prayer. He was a mighty man of prayer. And the prayers that we see recorded for us in the Bible were incredible. And they were in times of emergency. Uh, but that wasn't the only time he prayed. <laughs> Matter of fact, we don't even have his prayers recorded when he was in the lion's den, do we? But I think he spent the night in prayer. Uh, nothing wrong with that. But he got there because he prayed when he didn't need to. You understand that? He was a man of prayer. And because he was a, such a man of prayer, it was revealed unto him the entire history of the world. Until the end of time. Just read so Dan, Daniel chapter 9. He got, he got the revelations from God about the sequence of events. Why would him of everybody else? He was a man of prayer. Amen. A man of prayer. So uh, we, need to, we need to make sure that we pray when we're in need and when we're in trouble. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But let's make sure that's not the only time we pray. Uh, how, how much time has God been listening to us? Every idle word that men speak, they will give account thereof in the day of judgment. He's listening Amen. to every idle word that comes out of our mouths. No oh boy. He's paying close attention to us, not just when we're in need. He's paying <clears throat> close attention to us all the time. Let us be people that are pay close attention to God. Amen. Um, what a, what a wonderful thing. Uh, I, tremendous examples are given to us all through the scriptures. Too often times they're bad examples. How many times did, did Jesus pray in the presence of his disciples and they fell asleep while he was praying? Uh, so, 
uh, then there was a consistent man of God, and he prayed. Uh, and uh, here we have Jonah. He's responsible for over a million people, possibly a million people, coming to know the Lord, repenting of their sins, but he wasn't a man of prayer. What difference does it make? Well, how much, how many rewards is Jonah going to get for what he did? Not for me to say, but probably very little. Probably very little. And the final time, day of judgment, how much credit is he going to get for preaching to the Ninevites? Even though there was, there could be a million of them there who listened to him and heard him. I, I don't know. Anyway, letter number A, a motivated rebel. A motivated rebel. Uh, Affliction is a very powerful motivator. Did you ever wonder some days why is everybody always picking on me? <laughs> uh, well, maybe the Lord's allowing it to get your attention. To get you to stop looking around and start looking up. Um, he, uh, Jonah was motivated, finally. He's finally motivated to pray to the Lord. When he was on his ship and was about to sink, he didn't feel any motivation to pray. The ungodly sailors did. They prayed to their false gods with all their heart and mind and soul. It didn't do them any good. The only one, isn't it interesting, the only one on the ship that could pray wouldn't. Uh, I guess the book of Jonah could be described as how not to do it. Amen. But he was a motivated fi person finally. He was a motivated rebel. And affliction is a very powerful motivator. So when things are going wrong in your life, difficulties come up, uh, instead of accusing God and of being mean and nasty and uh, not paying any attention to you, maybe it's a sign he is paying a lot of attention to you. But you're not paying attention to him. Hmm. Just something to think about. Samson, he ran a course of disobedience. Warning after warning that was given to him went unheeded. Uh, but uh, when he stood before the crowd, finally, at his last moment, he could see better than ever before in his life. And he had no eyes. Mm -hmm. Samson had his eyes put out by the Philistines but when he when he was there and uh, he brought the building down on all of them and upon himself he could see better than ever before Amen. finally finally he could see God and God's will for his life and he prayed he says oh Lord God remember me I pray thee and strengthen me I pray thee only this once. <clears throat> Only this once. So that's uh, the time that, Jonah, that Samson prayed and God answered his prayer. Let her be, under Roman number one, a miserable reward. There's pleasure in sin for a season. Pleasure in sin for a season. Uh, a man, according to the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, a man of understanding walketh uprightly. Whatever price Jonah was unwilling to pay when God asked him to preach to Nineveh, now it seems pretty meager price to him compared to the cost of his disobedience being inside that fish for three days and three nights. Uh, and from the belly of that fish, he says, I will look again toward thy holy temple. Do you realize that the temple has been destroyed for almost 2,000 years. But you and I can still pray towards it. Because the true temple, which God pitched and not man, is in heaven, not on earth. Amen. Always has been. And until his coming again, it's going to stay there. But then it's going to come down to the earth and be on the earth. And so... Um, we, we need to be looking towards his holy temple when we pray. Yes. 
And when we do that, we will see ourselves and the world around us and God's will for our lives clearly. All right, so um, this, is, this is Jonah at his best. And for you and I, we're going to be at our best when we're on our knees. Amen. Sincerely seeking God to do God's will in our lives. All right, any questions or anything you want to add today? Our time is up again for this morning. All right, let's bow our heads and we'll close in prayer and get ready for our next service. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would guide and direct us as we look at these lessons from people of the past. We pray that the lessons that were so hard for them to learn, that we might be uh, easy students for you to teach and to reach, and that we might be able to glorify you by the examples that we have seen from the past. Bless us now in this day and to worship you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.